Hello, and a very warm welcome to you all. I'm Benjamin Simmons, head of the Green Growth Knowledge Partnership Secretariat. I would like to thank you for joining today's event. Go for SDGs presents Innovative Solutions for Micro, Small, and Medium Enterprises, MSMEs, in a Green Recovery. As you know, this is an official side event of the 2021 High-Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development. Today's webinar uh, has been jointly organized with the SEED Partnership, Go for SDGs, and the United Nations Environment Program, with uh, the kind, generous support from the Federal Ministry for Environment, Nature Conservation, and Nuclear Safety of Germany. Um, I should mention this is the second HLP event we've had the honor to host that spotlights the work of the Go for SDGs initiative. If you weren't able to join us at last year's event, I do encourage you to watch the recording of our first event. Uh, it was entitled Recovering Better, Global Opportunities for Jumpstarting the Real Economy. And this event showcased uh, various tools offered through the Go for SDGs menu of services, uh, which have all been um, pulled together to support a green economy transition. You can find the recording of this event or any of the GGKP knowledge, uh, on any of the GGKP knowledge platforms or on our YouTube channel. Uh, before we get started today, I'd like to say just a few uh, very short words on the Green Growth Knowledge Partnership for those who may not be familiar with the initiative. Uh, we are a global network of around 80 organizations from uh, ranging from policy, business, and finance communities, all committed to working together to support a green economy transition. We do this principally through our three global knowledge platforms, the Green Policy Platform, the Green Finance Platform, and the Green Industry Platform. And also a few months ago, we launched the Green Forum. This is an online community space that provides an opportunity for experts to engage directly with one another through either public discussion boards or for our partner organizations or other organizations to create their own public and private groups. Uh, if you haven't done so already, I would encourage you to visit the Green Forum and join, also join the 14,000 experts that currently receive the GGKP Knowledge Update newsletter. You can do this by subscribing at, at ggkp.org backslash subscribe. Finally, uh, I should mention that if you're interested in metals and minerals resource governance, the GGKP will be hosting another very interesting event this Thursday where the findings from stakeholder consultations that were undertaken in the context of the 2019 UNEA resolution on mineral resource governance will be discussed. Uh, you can also register for this event through the GGKP website. So we encourage you to attend uh, on Thursday as well. Now for today's webinar, we are extremely fortunate to have uh, very active and engaged discussions um, in our previous webinars, and I imagine the same will be true today. So I do encourage you to join uh, today's conversation by submitting any questions and comments you might have uh, using the chat function. And of course, after the event, we'd appreciate it if you could take a few minutes to also complete our survey. Um, please note that today's presentations, as well as a full recording of the webinar, will all be available um, on the GGKP website. Um, today, as you will have noted, we are joined by an extremely impressive panel of global experts and practitioners, and they'll be sharing some uh, stories, um, case studies of how micro, small, and medium-sized businesses are contributing to the green transition. And I'm delighted to say that leading us through this discussion will be the moderator for today's event, Josefo Shabalala. CEO of the Con Conversation Strategist. Now, Nozi, uh, we are very grateful to have you back with us today. Uh, as many of you know, Nozi wears many hats. She is an award-winning financial markets broadcaster, executive director at LRMG, a faculty member at Duke Corporation, uh, Corporate Education Africa, a fellow of the Gordon Institute for Business Sciences Center for African Management and Markets, and a Tutu Fellow. Uh, she's also been named one of the top 100 most influential young Africans and top 100 most influential young South Africans. And as you will soon discover, Nozi is an extremely skilled facilitator. Nozi, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you as the moderator for today's webinar. It's over to you. Thank you so much, Ben. Ever so gracious in your, the introduction, and thank you very much for the privilege uh, to serve uh, the audience and to serve today's conversation as the moderator of this critically important uh, conversation. I think Ben has done a lot of my positioning up front. The only thing that I'm going to reinforce and reiterate is to say to you, please, we do want you to own your share of voice in this conversation. And what that means is that throughout the next 90 minutes, um, I am going to invite you to be proactive in sending us through your comments, sending us through your questions as we go through the conversation. And I will try to the best of my ability to integrate your voice in this conversation. 
Of course, I know some of us are also going to be following on social media. Uh, we do have a hashtag for today. That's HLPF2021, uh, HLPF2021. Let's let the world know uh, what we are talking about. And of course, what we are talking about is innovative solutions for MSMEs in a green recovery. So in the panel conversation uh, today and throughout the conversation today, we're going to really be deep diving into the role and challenges of MSMEs in the green recovery. We're going to be looking at how MSMEs are uh, affected uh, by COVID-19 and how they're responding to the pandemic. We're going to look at the ecosystems that are available to MSMEs and which programs uh, exist within those ecosystems. And more importantly, what are some of the gaps that we need to be thinking about and how do we close them so that MSMEs really become uh, the jet fuel um, towards uh, a green uh, recovery? So without further ado, we're going to go into our very first session uh, of our program. And at this first session, we're going to be focusing on setting the scene from a political perspective. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome Madame Joyce Nsuya, who is uh, Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations and Deputy Executive Director at UNEP. I'm going to hand over to her shortly, but she's also going to be sharing this virtual stage in the scene setting uh, with Madame Anne Mareka Vancello, who is the Deputy Head of Division uh, for the United Nations, looking at developing countries and emerging economies. Uh, the Federal Ministry for the Environment, Nature Conversation, Conservation and Nuclear Safety. And she's really also going to be speaking to us about uh, some high level views on the importance of the sector and its contributions uh, to the Sustainable Development Goals. So with this, let me first hand over to Madame um, Surya and ask you, ma'am, um, how do we build forward better and open the floor to you in response? Thank you very much, uh, Nozi, for a very gracious uh, introduction. Uh, and also, I want to recognize uh, Anne-Marie for uh, being in this uh, opening uh, session uh, with me. So let me uh, make just a, a couple of uh, remarks, really, on why uh, SMEs and this initiative Go SDGs is extremely important especially at a time that we are in, uh, in the midst and in some parts still uh, part of the humanitarian aspect of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I will start with a Swahili proverb. Um, uh, since uh, UNEP is based in uh, Nairobi, Kenya, uh, I want to cite a proverb that is so meaningful for this session. And the proverb says in Kiswahili, Tazama ya kale ubashiri ya jayo. And roughly translated, it goes something like, consider the things that have passed, they predict what is coming. Uh, the world's climate scientists do this all the time. And what their work shows is that the future that awaits us is quite bleak. Uh, for more than uh, 10,000 years, we've enjoyed a period of stability that has allowed us to flourish as a species. But we have no maps for the world that comes next if we fail to act. We're simply not equipped to cope with the changes that we know are coming. Nor is the future we are warned about uh, is distant. We are seeing it materializing before us, the heat domes, wildfires, droughts, and floods that are intensifying around the world. And if we can be sure about anything at this particular moment, things will only continue to get worse unless uh, we act. And since I refer to the pandemic, uh, let me also cite that the economic fallout from the pandemic, which has dwarfed the Great Recession, is a bitter portent of the future. We are seeing vast unemployment, a spike in hunger, and a dramatic rise in poverty for the most part of the world. The devastation caused by the triple planetary crisis of climate change, nature loss, and pollution will be even greater more mass migration, more inequality, and more conflict are projected. But if we're going to uh, break from this cycle 
of a doom, then we need to step away from the linear economic model that have clung for too, too long. The mentality of grow now, clean up later must be jettisoned. And in this space, we must build an economy where materials stay in circulation for as long as possible, where products are designed and built to last. And this is where the SMEs are absolutely central. Most businesses in the world are SMEs. In emerging markets, for example, they create seven out of every 10 formal jobs. But they are also responsible of 70% of global pollution and 60% of global industrial carbon emissions. Clearly, if countries are going to achieve the sustainable development goals, then we must urgently help SMEs build back better and change the track. So how can we help the SMEs? For a start, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We don't need more guidelines and tools. We have enough. Instead, what we need is cooperation and implementation. And that's why this initiative, Go SDGs, comes in. This is about connecting the dots, building synergies, and bolstering cooperation between key strategic partners in a way that allows us to scale up and replicate best practices tailor-made for each region. Uh, firms need to stay competitive, we know that, and they need help making greener investments. They need easier access to financing that allows them to innovate. They also need new business models. They need to work out how to resource more efficiently, how to eliminate waste from their operations. And this is why the policy and innovation labs in Asia and Pacific and Africa are so transformative. It's why the training and tools we are rolling out are so important. And it is why we're looking, at hard, we're looking hard at financial mechanisms in Africa and Latin America that enhance secularity and connect macroeconomic efforts to the real economies to support SMEs. But also we are doing all this because we are transforming the way SMEs operate. Uh, and this is essential if we are to recover uh, in a greener uh, fashion from the pandemic, that the way that we do not exacerbate today's planetary crisis. And we are doing this because we know a shift to secularity is essential if we want to change the patterns of consumption and production that are fueling the triple planetary crisis. And we are also doing this because we know that if we don't, then we will leave our children and grandchildren a world for which our species is well ill-prepared. So let us bolster these efforts today. And I'm really looking forward to this panel and the deliberations uh, to see how we can concretely scale up our impact. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Suya. And of course, maybe just to lift some of the things you've shared with us before I hand over to Anne Marika. And that's, you know, that, that the proverb that you use, consider the things uh, that have passed because they predict what is coming. Certainly a very clear call to action for us. And some of those uh, elements of the clear, uh, call to action are so clear. We need to break away from the linear economy. We need to be more deliberate about our shift towards circularity because it is essential. We need to rethink business models and rethink incentives for greener investments. And of course, the greatest opportunity, as you've outlined, is that if seven out of 10 jobs are today created by uh, SMEs, how do we ensure that we build forward better by ensure that, ensuring that we are producing greener jobs in a green economy and really seeing a more inclusive and green recovery as a result. Thank you very much for those opening comments. I think you've done a fantastic job of giving us a great frame. And Marika, I hand over to you now, as you also maybe give us a more concrete linkage um, between MSMEs and their contribution to the Sustainable Development Goals. Over to you. Thank you very much. And first of all, Joyce, it's also very nice to see you again, even though just virtually. I hope at some point we can also see each other in real life again, not too far from now. 
Um, I'm very happy to be here today on behalf of the German Ministry for the Environment, Nature Conservation and Nuclear Safety. Um, Germany has been a long-standing supporter of both GTKP and SEED and we were among those initiating Go for SDGs. So we are very happy to see those initiatives and partnerships now coming together and partnering up for these events because Actually, this partnering up, this use of the synergies and the spreading of available best practices and instruments was actually the very idea we had when we decided to set up Go for SDGs. And to my understanding, it's also at the heart of DGKP. Um, Joyce has already said it. Um, most of the crises are already here. I mean, look at the climate crisis, biodiversity crisis. So we really do not have the time to reinvent the wheel. And instead, we should really use those best practices and instruments we have at hand. And we think that initiatives like Go for SDGs, GTKP, they can really play a big, important role in this. So we are very happy to see you even having a bigger network here than just in your own initiatives. Um, we are also very delighted that you're putting SMEs in the spotlight of this event. Um, as it was already said, we think they play a very central role for SDG implementation on the ground. Um, Nozi, we have been in another side event, I think on Friday, where Guy Ryder was also speaking and he said, well, on the aggregate level, it all makes sense, but now we have to bring it to the people, to the ground. And we believe that SMEs can actually do this contribution and play this role. They can bring the implementation on the, of the SDGs to the ground and they can also, they're very well positioned to uh, cover all three dimensions of the SDGs, like bringing social change, economic development, but also bringing benefits for the environment. And I think two or three years ago, I was in South Africa for one of the page ministerial conferences and there we had the opportunity to visit one of the seed award winners from South Africa. And I think it was called All Women's Recycling. And I, it was very impressive to see how this startup that actually really served all the different dimensions of the 2030 agenda. And um, for those of you who don't know it, it's a small company which is manufacturing gift box from plastic bottles. So it's both bringing along an economic benefit while doing something good for the environment and was mainly was all women working there and mainly migrant women so it also really um, had a lot of value added for the social dimensions so I'm very happy to see that seed is also part of this conversation here and I'm looking forward to hear about the award winners you are going to announce today because I think you're doing a very very important job there um, we at the BMU, like the Ministry for the Environment in Germany, we believe that actually nowadays it's even more important to support SMEs because we believe they play a very important role in overcoming the socioeconomic consequences of the pandemic. And here we really need smart and innovative business models and business ideas which and people who are willing to think outside the box and to actually come up with innovative ideas to and, and innovative solutions to bring along the change we need. And from our experience, sometimes small startups are actually way better positioned to think outside the box because they're not so much constrained by the business models they're already operating in. So yeah, I think you cannot overestimate the role of startups and small enterprises and medium-sized enterprises to this very challenging, um, challenging role we have in front of us. At the same time, there's evidence that SMEs are among those who are worst hit by the crisis. Um, I guess there are many reasons for this. For example, they don't have so much savings on the side as larger companies who have been there for a longer time. And at the same time, at least here in Germany, many of the companies we tried to save during the pandemic, they were really the big companies which were considered as too big to fail. So sometimes SMEs kind of fall through the gaps, even though here in Germany, we're really trying to counter this uh, problem and also <laughs> try to um, to come up with support system for SMEs. So in our COVID response packages, we set up an additional support program to help young innovative enterprises to, to survive the crisis and to survive those months where they maybe did not have 
the income coming in they needed. And we also set up a new equity, uh, equity capital fund, which is called Future Fund with KFW, our state-owned development bank. And this capital fund was also um, is envisioned to help um, young enterprises in the capital intensive starting time, which I think you all know is the hardest <laughs> period for any new company. In addition, we are trying to support green and uh, sustainable SMEs globally. And I think here Seed really plays a leading role in equipping young entrepreneurs with innovative business ideas and with, uh, no, and with the necessary tools and the knowledge and the networks they really need to thrive. So we think this way Seed is really doing a great job in accelerating change on the ground. And it's really good that we have partners like GDKP and Go for SDGs on the side of seeds so they can also spread and disseminate all those tools and networks and the business ideas which were developed by the seed award winners so i hope very much that the side event will help to further disseminate disseminate those uh, very good examples and best practices and will continue to drive forward this conversation and i'm very much looking forward to hear from the panelists and from the experience of the practitioners thank you very much Thank you very much. Uh, again, um, a really insightful contribution here. And uh, starting off by emphasizing uh, together with uh, Madame Suya the importance of partnership and, and, and cooperation and collaboration is what I'm hearing. Um, and the emphasis on the urgency, we don't have the time, we don't have time to reinvent the wheel is what I've heard. Um, I think what's really exciting and Marika, which you've lifted is how MSMEs really allow us to make a green recovery tangible for it to reach the ground and it to not uh, die as a theoretical concept. Um, some interesting thoughts around the equity capital fund and other investment or um, financing measures, which I'm sure are going to be part of the conversation going forward. Now, I've made a promise to my audience that I'm going to bring their voices into this conversation. Um, and so I can see that we are beginning to get some of those questions in. Um, I'm going to ask just for a very quick 30 second response, knowing that we're probably going to get more detail as we as we go in. But maybe, Madame Suya, can I bring this question to you from Ghana? It's a question from EcoWorld Ghana, very quick question, it says, you know, um, how can MSMEs in Africa especially startups, solve the challenge of access to finance, um, uh, given the fact that sometimes there are unachievable criteria, there's early stage risk, uh, collateral and guarantees that these M uh, SMEs sometimes don't have. I know this is something we're going to speak about in detail, but I'd love just to hear your headline response um, around that. And then Anne Marika, I'll bring you another question before we move on to our next segment. Thank you very much, uh, Nozi, and uh, thank you for uh, the person who asked the question from Ghana. I actually would like to use an example from Ghana because one of the last uh, uh, visits that I did officially was actually to Accra. And I met with a, a MSME that uh, was converting waste, electric waste, into wealth. And they had set up uh, a very nice and innovative shop just in the uh, outside Accra and actually making profit out of it. And some of the questions I had was how did they uh, secure financing to promote environmental sustainability, going to the slums in Accra, collecting e-waste and converting them into furnitures and actually they were exporting outside Accra. And their uh, uh, um, uh, response was on three folds, which I thought I should share with you practically. One, the government of Ghana had put some regulation that was pro-MSMEs, because you do need the regulatory framework in the financial markets, and I see the panel will touch upon that, to actually spur and create space upstream in promoting uh, access to finance for uh, medium and small uh, enterprises. Two, it's through associations. So this particular innovator of a company, uh, he actually went out and advocated for environmental sustainability, including how e-waste can actually be converted into a business. And that entailed capacity building, 
I know Germany supported as well as the EU in terms of building the capacity of small medium enterprises to develop business uh, plans uh, to access the finance. And then three, it's the engagement with the financial markets. And that's where you need a combination of public and private, because the banks that provided initial loans to this particular business had the regulatory framework, my number one point, which actually uh, helped uh, access to finance uh, for this particular uh, uh, small medium enterprise. But I recognize each country is different, but I would summarize regulation, uh, public-private partnerships, as well as capacity building and providing tools. And that's why Go SDGs and the partnerships from Germany and others are absolutely central. Sorry, it's more than 30 seconds, but I thought I should share that. Over it's, to it's you. Practical. It's practical, which is exactly what we're looking for. And of course, using a live example is even more useful. Um, and Marik, I'm going to just come to you and I'm going to ask you to give me a, a 30 second headline if you can. But there's a beautiful question from Brian McGee and Brian is saying, how can SMEs access the funding lines to get to the next stage? So beyond, um, how do we access funding for, for growth so that we're not just micro businesses, we're not just small enterprises, but perhaps we progress towards medium sized enterprises. A high level thought uh, from you as to how do we, how do we fund um, growth uh, and not just fund startup? Um, thank you. Well, very honestly speaking, I'm not a finance expert, so I guess it would be better to ask this question to the colleagues from SEED in the next round, because I know they're actually working on this and we provided funding for them to work on it. So sometimes it's better if the real experts work on certain questions. Um, however, I also wanted to come back to the last question about the financing and how um, little SMEs, especially in Africa, can access this this and we actually had some event with the UN task force on digitalization for sustainable finance and I think there are also some really really great opportunities how other startups in the digital area field can actually help other SMEs to get the funding I know this is more small funding which you need in the beginning but some of the examples they showed us in this task force it was really amazing and I think they actually we in Europe can also learn a lot from Africa on how to access funding so I think, yeah, those events where you share a lot of those best practices, examples, it's really, really helpful for everybody on, on from the UN membership. And it's not a one-way street. Thank you. And Marika, thank you very much. It's a very smart response and it certainly sets up our next uh, segment where we are going to be uh, sharing some of those innovative solutions um, in terms of how those that are coming up and surfacing uh, from the ground but also you know the fact that you highlight the importance of best practice and sharing some of that is equally important and part of what we are doing today so just as we close off now this um, opening scene setting session i'd like to thank you um uh, madame msuya madame vancelo thank you very much uh, for opening us um the, today and really giving us a fantastic frame to our audience um appreciating your engagement let's keep it going as we bring more conversation and engagement going forward we're going to move now uh to hear in our seg second segment of our conversation um from mirko zucker and he is the head of uh, program development at SEED. Mirko, you've already heard um, from Anne Marika that you have the job of also speaking to some of the growth um, funding that she has passed on to you as one of the questions. But I know that you're going to share a presentation for us that's really going to look at green recovery and some of the MSME findings. Um, your presentation is on screen. And so we're really looking to see how these become a driving force for a green recovery. I'm going to open up to you and to say to our audience again, uh, once Mirko is done with his presentation, let's engage him uh, and let's stress test some of the insights he's going to share with us. It's over to you for now. Yeah, thank you so much, Nozi, um, for, for um, this introduction and also to Joyce and Anne for kind of recognizing the role of eco-inclusive enterprises and the role of kind of seed in this so maybe a couple of sentences about seed and what we are doing so actually nosy we are kind of a baby seed is born in johannesburg south africa at the kind of world summit of sustainable development um so we're kind of unep undp and iocn as founding partners kind of initiated seed and now basically next year 
since 20 years um, we are now supporting more than we have supported more than thousand enterprises around the globe and have worked with multiple intermediaries policymakers and financiers as well beyond what we call on the one hand side where we work on two levels we work at the ecosystem building one but we also work at the enterprise support level second and as part of this ecosystem building activities we are also kind of a proud partner of go for sdgs uh, next slide please so on behalf of kind of go for sdgs maybe some key points um, on the kind of overall ambition as Joyce and Anne also have mentioned already. It's about connecting the dots and building synergies and uh, this kind of collaboration to scale and replicate kind of back press practices, bringing different kind of key strategic partners and alliances together. And we are really happy to be part of this as seed, as part of this kind of uh, organization who works jointly with go for sdgs around kind of three main components. One, with governments to enhance policy coherence. Next slide, please. Um, second, with SMEs to advance innovation and circularity. And third, with use to empower this. And one of the core objectives is similar to see to support small and medium enterprises to increase their capacities and increase access to finance, focusing on innovation and circularity. And during this first year, there were quite a couple of uh, activities carried out, as you can see on the slide. And with SEED, we also were one of the key implementing partners implementing this policy and financing labs in Africa and Asia. Next slide, please. Coming back to SEED's core activities, there is basically this enterprise support level on the one hand side and ecosystem building on the other side. And we basically thought about, so now how can we use this knowledge, this contact, this relationships to on the one hand side, better understand the role of eco-inclusive enterprises and then the other hand side also to demonstrate their kind of green recovery contribution. So next slide, please. So to do this, we basically were also running interviews at these two levels. First, I wanna talk a bit about what we found when we now analyze this eco-inclusive enterprise. So we found basically uh, looking at the 2019-20 cohort of enterprises that we support as seed winners and runners up, we basically looked at them, how they contribute to green recovery. And we found that they contribute to kind of green recovery in multiple ways. One as kind of green job creators, second as what we call basic service enablers, third green as green technology providers, fourth as nature conservation and fifth actually as resilience builders so we saw that these enterprises actually by operating the way they do they achieve all these different kind of green recovery goals and um and are in this way basically also very much working at this nexus with kind of green recovery next slide please so we asked them actually in particular we were running in-depth interviews with them and we looked back with them at kind of their data points from kind of 2020, where we all know the world was as difficult as it as it was. And despite all these kind of challenges, we could see that these enterprises still kind of created jobs. As you can see, more than 50% still made sure that they kind of could, could provide high safety nets to their communities. Um, depending on the sector that they are operating, I mean, we look at seed at sectors which are in agriculture, waste, water, um, and biodiversity, energy. Depending on the sectors where they are operating, obviously many of them said that they would um, contribute highly to energy savings, water savings, and emission saving, depending on their business model. But similar to this, also many of those agriculture and forestry model enterprises, many of them also had a strong contribution to nature conservation being this kind of nature conservationists. So looking at all of those, we saw that actually a very large percentage also invested in digital infrastructure, supporting the digital transformation um, along their value chain, but also beyond. So next slide, we found actually in looking at their value chain in particular and the kind of contribution that they had, uh, especially from the green recovery perspective, that they have a very big kind of contribution to informal employment. As you can see, they are like a big kind of contributor 
to to women employment, gender uh, female empowerment, um, um, making sure engaging them in the distribution of the kind of green products and services. We looked at um, um, we found that these enterprises provide a lot of kind of eco economic opportunities to their suppliers, but also to their employees at the base of the pyramid, what others also call BOP. And we saw that they are kind of rural um, that they largely engage with rural, low-income and informal suppliers, which play a kind of significant role in the production of green products and services. So they are kind of a big contributors to the kind of local economies. And by doing this, uh, doing this also in a, in a, in a green um, and, and, and sustainable way. But next slide, we move beyond only looking at enterprises, also taking our contacts with intermediaries and policy making institutions, interviewing actually how other organizations are supporting also green recovery and enterprises, uh, which are eco inclusive enterprises and SMEs. And we saw actually in these interviews uh, that we have identified five different pathways depending on the intervention level and the intervention focus of these kind of organizations that we have interviewed, we saw there is this one set of organizations which looks at it from a adapters uh, that we have called adapters. They look at their existing off-the-shelf programs and make made their programs more widely accessible, making it uh, more relevant to kind of green recovery. We looked at what we call the amplifiers, where we, we saw enterprise support programs, which didn't yet tailor their support programs so much to kind of green recovery, but still having a kind of significant impact. We saw actually across the board, everybody went digital, everybody actually supported their, uh, was uh, making their, their programs accessible via using digital tools and platforms. But we saw also at the more kind of macro policy intervention level that many of the orchestrators, as we call them, they uh, they made use of their existing programs, which were related to specific green recovery related sectors or programs mainstreaming green recovery considerations. And the convergers, as we call them, they looked more at kind of their existing mid and long term programs, integrating kind of green recovery, going also well beyond eco inclusive enterprises. So next slide, please. Based on all these findings, when we looked at the eco-inclusive enterprises and, uh, and understanding these different programs, we saw actually there are kind of five key recommendations, which we actually would like to recommend to financial institutions, donors, and governments, how they can actually support these pathways of these support organizations, which at the very end will benefit also eco-inclusive enterprises. We basically would assume that, um, that um, on the first, it's important to have more kind of targeted um, uh, financial support programs, especially for this kind of pioneering programs, which we call the kind of adapters, which we call the kind of amplifiers. We uh, All these programs largely rely on digital infrastructure, so a lot more digital infrastructure building needs to happen to make sure these programs can also reach their beneficiaries. We basically saw that to recognize, uh, to, to give eco-inclusive SMEs more recognition, we need more of these kind of impact studies and more evidence that we can demonstrate also the impact leading overly to an old idea where we actually feel we need something like a green recovery typology or taxonomy which integrates also this kind of um, eco, SM, eco inclusive SME perspectives to recognize them and to really make sure they are also benefiting because at the very end it's all about what we also saw there are a lot of kind of great lessons learned that are applied by the support program so we hope that also new kind of recovery schemes are really leveraging it to make sure at the very end the barriers uh, for these enterprises are minimized so the last slide uh, next slide please is for, for us today we are launching not only this program so please uh, colleagues are sharing them now we at the chat um, we are not only launching this kind of green recovery snapshot, but we are also actually launching a kind of comparative kind of case study report where we actually in in-depth interviews were looking at nine eco-inclusive enterprises and looked at their achievements um, and looked at their journeys and developed a kind of typology. So for everybody who is interested to understand what is this kind of eco-inclusive enterprise to understand how are they, how are their kind of journeys to scale please have a look at this report because there are some exciting insights that are really critical to for the design of kind of future green recovery of private sector programs. So um, yeah, 
thanks um, for uh, for uh, yeah also to the TGKP to have the uh, to have the chance to use this platform to present our findings, also setting a bit the tone for these kind of award winners that will be announced later. So, Nosy, thanks. Thank you very much. It's absolutely excellent. And perhaps just to uh, re-emphasize what you've just said right at the end, uh, the, the fact that today we're also seeing the launch of these two landmark reports. You have indicated, I think, uh, those reports already, the, the links are already being put into the chat. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's, uh, let's make use of these resources, the Green Recovery Snapshot, as well as the Comparative Case Study Report, Certainly excellent resources. And of course, Mirko, um, it's, it's always good when we can see some crystallized uh, recommendations and an excellent job of saying, here are the five recommendations. Obviously understanding that there's always contextualization in, in each specific market, but excellent guidelines to see how we might build on these in our respective markets. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Mirko is here. If you do have any questions for him, please do uh, pop them in the chat. Mirko, I'm going to be a little bit mischievous, and I'd like to just bring a question to you that uh, popped up in the chat before you started, but I do think having listened to you that this is, um, quite a, this is a question that I think you can lean into. Um, and I'm just scrolling down here on my chat on my side, Joe, so that I can just um, land it um, on it. There it is. It's a question that comes from uh, May Mjuda. And May is saying, are green jobs sustainable, though? Or is it about innovation around environmental problems? And I would imagine, uh, Mirko, that this is a conversation that you've had to have on multiple occasions um, as you position some of the work that you do. Would you like just to share your thoughts um, on that question to Maim Judah? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, and then I think I can happy to talk also on the finance question, which was which was posted before. So how we actually see actually, and that's the exciting thing working with eco inclusive enterprises that they are on the one hand side innovators, right? They innovate, they want to solve a social kind of problem and environmental problem. They come up with new kind of products and services, but they are like job creators first of all directly, but also to a large extent indirectly. I mean, to be it's it's fair to say because I mean these are sometimes kind of difficult markets and it's sometimes also difficult for them as part of kind of um, also the, 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 uh, what we saw last year that some of those enterprises maybe for, before they worked with people um, which had um, which had people employed and then they moved to have people more as part of their suppliers or as part of uh, distribution partners still involved um, in their overall value chain creating jobs maybe more indirectly so this is what we are seeing largely as well uh, but at the very end it always starts with kind of innovation and it always um, ends at the very end with kind of jobs and this we see across the board when it comes to this kind of question of access to finance and um, there I can also highly recommend um, this kind of journeys to scale report where we looked also at the kind of finance trajectories of these different kind of enterprises and we have seen basically it's very different um, there are some which we call the disruptors so this disruptors which are disrupting with their innovation um, a market um, they have completely different uh, trajectories and are often in a position to also access kind of commercial finance where we have on the other hand side uh, the on the other spectrum what we call the necess necess necessity driven enterprises which have a completely different slower kind of trajectory which are often rather using family and friends and which are often also going back to 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 bank finance um, at the terms that are available in the kind of local market because they are just not attractive for investors and i think that's basically also for us as support providers at green, green recovery supporters that we need to understand how can we support and tailor our programs to these different trajectories and this different typology of enterprises so as you said nosy very well at the very end it's about tailoring these recommendations and tailoring these programs to the specific needs of these enterprises as much as possible Mirko, thank you very much. It's an excellent response. And I'm just noting some of the conversation in the chat as well, where Edgar Mugisha was asking whether SEED has explored the possibility of piloting a green financing fund for MSMEs. I know Linda has responded with some of the work that is happening in Uganda, but maybe just a 10-seconder from you, Mirko, before we move to the next segment. 
So yeah, from our perspective, it's really about, from our perspective, we are keen to work with banks, to explore with banks how existing kind of credit lines can be used to make them kind of green, because often we feel they yet don't understand very well the models of these enterprises and they are missing the pipeline. So what we see, we are building a pipeline which in quite many occasions is relevant for banks. So we want to now kind of bridge this, back, uh, this gap in working with banks in particular. And this we are doing with Uganda also jointly with kind of go for SDGs as part of our financing lab coming up later in the year. No, Marco, thank you very much. Uh, it's an excellent um, part of our session too that you have launched and shared some of those insights and recommendations. Thank you very much. I'm going to now move on to our panel discussion uh, where I'm going to introduce our panel panelists. And of course, in this conversation, we really wanting to showcase some of the MSME solutions for green recovery. We want to highlight some of the relevant tools uh, and initiatives that are coming to the surface in the context of a green recovery and a green economy. I'm going to ask my panelists to pop on their cameras. We are joined by Mr. Lee Hender Reuters. He is a regional director in the South African Cleaner Production Center. He joins us from Cape Town, which uh, he made a point of telling me is a little bit warmer than Johannesburg, where I am at at the moment. We're also joined by Madame Camilla uh, Pentinau, who is a partner at Yield Lab. Um, Camilla, thank you very much uh, for, for joining us. Uh, Mr. Hans McNulty, um, a big welcome to you. He's a senior green industry advisor uh, for uh, GGKP and the ICO initiative. Hans, it's lovely to have you um, with us as well. So maybe Lee Hender, I'm going to um, I'm going to kick off with you. Given the fact that your work is based uh, in Africa, maybe you can just spend a little bit of time uh, sharing some of the best practices and initiatives um, that uh, are supporting uh, MSMEs um, in the green recovery. And as you do, allow me again to encourage our audience to bring their voices into this conversation. Lee Hender, it's uh, over to you first. Thank you, Nosey, um, and thank you for having me today. Um, yes, I think you know, as you as you mentioned, this is uh, uh, the role that that we play. I'm part of the National Cleaner Production Center of South Africa, and uh, we form part of a, a group of cleaner production centers on the continent. And um, so I think the, that in itself, from a network perspective, if you if you look at the mandate of, of national cleaner production centers to support um, SMEs in the manufacturing sector and in and different other sectors, the the role that, that is placed first and foremost by um, NCPCs around the continent is already a very important connection to the SME networks on the continent. Um, what we have picked up, uh, particularly working closely with the UN uh, Environmental uh, Program Africa Office, um, specifically the Switch Africa Green Program that has been quite significant in engaging SMEs um, on uh, supporting them to adopt green um, methodologies and business models we've seen that a number of SMEs have successfully adopted the thinking around resource efficiency, um, supporting or moving towards waste and uh, new green business models. However, um, I think as we've seen from some of the comments already, um, there is a need for a lot more support and what we've picked up is that there's a number of networks or SME networks that operates in various sectors and various uh, geographical areas or regional areas of the continent. However, there's also a strong need for a lot more collaboration and learning and sharing of learning amongst SMEs. Um, we've had some interesting engagements during 2020 um, when we particularly looked at how new um, design practices are featuring in startups and in SMEs. And this is an area that is quite important for SMEs when they think about pivoting and um, moving into uh, growing themselves as businesses to look at how the product designs and how the service designs um, speaks to circular business models, the principles of circular business models, and how that can um, 
further uh, develop and grow themselves. Of course, there's a lot of support when it comes to financing. Um, we've seen uh, quite a big and strong growth in terms of um, financing or um, uh, I would say VC opportunities for startups. And as we, as we heard earlier, startups are starting to set the trend for SME growth and development on the continent. And we've seen that um, with startups um, taking on the green um, and circular um, business models and coming up with new designs for products that takes into consideration a waste that has been a uh, characteristic of how startups have started to grow and uh, taking advantage of the many um, support, financial support, whether it's accelerator programs or um, whether it is incubation programs or contests um, that offers them financing or winning money for the concepts that has helped to boost um, the SME uh, basis in in Africa. Uh, Lee Henda, I think it's 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 such interesting insights, and I think Kamia, um, it just it's, it's a natural progression for us to start talking about some of the work that you're doing in terms of uh, agro tech startups. Uh, but you know, Lee Henda, as you as you raise um, you know some of the efforts to rethink and reimagine those business models, and how do we ensure that from a product and, and service design there is a, cl a clear alignment to, to green uh, methodologies and green business models. I'm going to unpack that a little bit more, but I do want to just make a comment uh, that uh, Janet Nyamusi has sent us from our global audience, and Janet says, from experience, financial support is the main challenge for SMEs to adopt eco innovations. If we have to get back better, then we have to look, um, we need to not only look at ways to provide SMEs with information, but also look at financial support. And of course, Lee Henda, this is one of the things that you have touched on. Camille, as I come to you, maybe this is an opportunity for you to share some of the exciting work that you're doing in the agricultural space um, that we are seeing between go for sedgs and Yield Lab doing together. Tell us more, what is happening in that space? Yeah, hi, hi everyone, and thank you, Nosi, for this time. Um, just to provide a little bit of context, I would like to, to let you know uh, a little bit of the Yield Lab as an organization, a global organization, and also the Yield Lab Institute, which is our um, think tank and part of the one of the organization, the organizers of this uh, sustainable ag tech challenge that we are launching in Latin America and the Caribbean. So basically, the Yield Lab is, a, as I was saying before, a global organization, a network of accelerator and venture capital firms that are, we are focused on investing in early stage stages of um, uh, agri tech, agri food tech startups. I'm part of the Yield Lab Latam Latin American team. I'm based out of Buenos Aires, and so we have been doing a lot of work here in Latin America um, in developing the ecosystem, right? And so within that work, we, we, uh, we discovered that there were many, uh, and there was an untapped potential in terms of um, the agri-food tech startup thinking themselves as a, potent, as, as a, as a vehicle for impact, right? So, so uh, thinking themselves as, as, a, as, as truly having the, the, um, the potential to, tr to drive sustainability across the region in many of the of the of the crop production uh, ecosystems that we have in Latin America, and so we reach out to the UN UNEP and the, within the, with the Yield Lab Institute, which is uh, um, uh, our our think tank arm that has been uh, consistently driving uh, many different challenges like sector uh, innovation challenges, and we plan this open innovation initiative to actually scout discover and empower um, basically Latin American and Caribbean startups, SMEs and innovation projects that would target many of or, or, or all the, the um, uh, sust sustainable challenges that we have uh, within the, the region um, and trying to, to, to select those uh, that, uh, that that aim to, to increase uh, productivity in a more sustainable way, uh, mitigate greenhouse emissions, uh, promote 
adaptation and resilience with, uh, in front of uh, the uh, climate change. And so we, we, we defined three verticals to, to, to tackle these, um, uh, these challenges. One is high value crops, the other is row crops, and the last one is uh, animal proteins and alternative uh, proteins. So we are encouraging everyone, not only in Latin America, but uh, globally also, uh, to participate. We are uh, driving the application through f platform, and um, you, can, uh, you can apply until July 21st. And we will have, of course, a, a, a selection process, evaluation process, where UNEP, of course, will be super involved. And uh, the final will be in a demo day, uh, the October 13th. So we have some prizes to also in incentivize and encourage, but we are super, super excited to, to let you know, to share with, with all the audience that so far we have uh, more than 80 applications um, from, from all the uh, Latin American and the Caribbean. We are trying to drive more applications. We are seeing a lot of innovation happening many research uh, institutions applying to with their projects, uh, SMEs, startups. So it will be super interesting to, to, to see how we can capitalize on all these findings, right? And so uh, as we were also planning the, the challenge, the innovation challenge, we and, and engaging with all the SMEs and startups to see the appetite to, to participate, uh, we also discovered that that um, that there was there was not a lot a lot done in terms of uh, how we are going to help these companies um, become part of the green recovery, right? And so uh, so we decided to additionally to the challenge uh, do a policy assessment report to identify specifically for Latin American and the Caribbean, as you were saying, Nosi, you have we have to to really adapt and bring to the ground uh, all these guidelines that we have around the world in terms of how we want to help um, SMEs uh, become greener or help in the green recovery. And so we, we are going to, with this report, we are going to not only understand which are the innovations and which are the uh, opportunities that, that startups and SMEs are trying to tackle, but also understand where are the challenges, where, I mean, uh, how, what are the challenges to scale? What are the challenges to get finance? Um, what, what is the real impact in terms of um, uh, sustainability, social, economic uh, aspects? And, and, and at the end, the idea is to, to, to really come up with, the, uh, with a more uh, precise, concrete way on how policymakers can actually empower and, and promote uh, in each one of their, uh, of their um, mm. sector, uh, how yeah. they can actually help these, these startups. Yeah, Camille, thank you very much uh, for that. You've not only shared some of the work that you're doing, but I think there's some beautiful linkages um, that you're speaking about as you talk about how do we bring policy closer to the ground so that the policy is sharper and more responsive. And so the policy assessment is quite exciting. Um, of course, we look forward uh, to, the, to the information for July 21st uh, and the call to action for many more to apply. Um, and again, as I'm listening to you, really grappling with how do we empower and how do we enable? And that, of course, is a very important part of this conversation. Hans, I, 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 you know, one of the things that Lee Hender spoke about is, you know, the transition towards um, greener business models. The, um, we heard uh, Joyce and Suya talking about um, capacity, making sure that we are supporting through capacity building. Maybe you can share a little bit uh, with us about the work uh, that uh, go for SEGs and GGKP are doing together uh, to support SMMEs uh, to, uh, to move towards green operations and also uh, to build the necessary capacity to execute uh, within those green frameworks. Over to you, Hans. For some reason, Hans, we can't seem to hear you. Can I ask for you just to check your audio for me? Yes, I have done the usual mistake of having a chat with you silently. But apologies for that. Someone had to do it today, so I'm glad it was me. Um, so thank you for the opportunity. 
uh, to be here today. It's really much appreciated. And I'm delighted to be able to talk about this IGO initiative that has been developed by the Green Industry Platform and uh, which is being deployed in collaboration with the Go for SDGs. Now, IGO is a quite a new initiative that is honestly still in development. And the objective is to be able to provide tailored resource efficiency knowledge and support services to businesses, and in particular SMEs. Now, the specific challenges IGO aims to address, and this, this is in relation to the uptake of resource efficiency by SMEs, is how can we effect, effectively connect with large numbers of SMEs on the topic of resource efficiency? And then how can we support those SMEs according to their specific resource efficiency needs, whether it's by sector or location or, yes, their size even? And so what IGO is, IGO is not an initiative that is aiming to duplicate uh, the efforts of existing initiatives, Rather, IGO is a support structure to help make better use of what's already being done. Many different initiatives are already out there helping SMEs, supporting SMEs. What we're aiming to do is to provide, a, let's call it a more uniform, consistent approach by, let's say, connecting the dots between the different initiatives and providing a kind of a, a full-scale support structure for both these organizations that already provide resources and the SMEs themselves. So, to explain a little bit how IGO works, let me first outline a key issue that we have when it comes to SMEs and their everyday operations. SME everyday operations are far away from resource efficiency action. The reality is there is no business case for SMEs to engage in resource efficiency. It's just, why? I mean, it doesn't, their clients very often don't require it, and it's not part of their usual business routine. So, the first thing that IGO does is it looks at the business drivers for resource efficiency and how to increase these and let's say bring about a change on in SME everyday operations by connecting the business case to resource efficiency. To do this, IGO and the Green Industry Platform is collaborating with the Unido Industry Working Group, which works with large companies uh, who are interested to improve the resource efficiency of their supply chain companies. So this is an effort to coordinate large company efforts on engaging with their SMEs in the supply chain to kind of push uh, resource efficiency as a business requirement. Now, creating the business driver for resource efficiency is not enough because essentially what that means is SMEs suddenly are faced with the need to become more resource efficient and they're not too sure how to do it how to comply, et cetera. So what IGO then does, it has put in place a self-assessment tool, which enables a SME to understand very quickly what their resource efficiency is in relation to, say, the requirements of their client. Importantly, based on this resource efficiency status, the tool provides concrete recommendations that are adapted to the specific needs of the SMEs, and then most importantly, points the SME in the direction of key support services that are available in their location, specific to their sector, and that will help them implement those recommendations. Now, whilst that is a great thing, obviously we also then need to, let's say, provide the information for this tool. We need to be able to bring together all of the resource efficiency knowledge and support services on a country level to feed into this tool so that the SMEs get their customized information. To do that, we work with organizations in country to bring together the different types of support services. What that also then does is it creates a feedback loop. We understand the needs of SMEs, we understand what is available on a country level, and we can help organizations actually improve and adapt their support services. Now, all of these knowledge and support services are maintained in our SME Support Center database, which is also an online tool. Now, going forward, what something we haven't developed yet is an implementation management tool, which will then help SMEs manage, for example, their audit data, uh, give them step-by-step -step guidance on implementing measures if they have now this improved capacity and skills and most importantly gives them a way to report on their performance. 
We are going to be testing all of this in three regions in collaboration with Gopher SDGs, Eastern Europe, Central Asia, Africa, and Latin America over the next nine months. Uh, of course, anybody here who's taking part in the webinar who's interested to learn more, it'd be great to hear from you. And rather than step over my time, let me just finish by saying that IGO really is a way of connecting the dots by helping both SMEs and supporting organizations that want to engage more effectively with the SMEs. Hans, uh, I love the way you ended it in connecting the dots. Um, it's an incredible initiative, uh, bringing into view those supply chains, um, lifting up uh, some of the gaps through the self-assessment, but also um, pointing to some of the no uh, to the knowledge and the resources. I'm particularly excited about the feedback loops, um, and you spoke a lot about this at a national level. Lee Hand, I wanna I wanna build up on this. I mean, a huge part of our conversation has been how do we scale. So I wanna take what Hans has shared with us and say what could this look like at a regional uh, level? Uh, where we're really scaling uh, some of these innovative uh, solutions. Um, I'm keen to hear your voice on how IGO could be part of the necessary capacity building efforts um, at a regional level. Thanks, Nozi. Well, I think we, we heard from, um, I think, the, the first speaker today that there's a lot of tools that's already developed and we, we don't need more tools. We need to talk about how to use them. And I think that is the first step towards um, harnessing the power or, or the benefits of IGO is, is that it creates a platform for us to talk with one another, to understand how tools have worked in certain parts of the region or in a country or in a, uh, on the continent. And I think that contextual aspect becomes important because we do understand that uh, the different sectors, um, they have different impacts in different areas. So I think what we cannot take away from this equation and, and what is important dot to connect is uh, peer learning as well as understanding how to pivot or scale what we are doing. Um, so there's a lot of new ideas, there's a lot of new concepts that introduced and um, I do understand and I've seen how a lot of SMEs struggle to keep up with all of the changing terms and all the changing concepts. So that is an important aspect when it comes to capacity building is, uh, yeah. I mean, we're talking about eco-inclusiveness, we're talking about eco-innovation, we talk about circular economy principles, and how do we make this a user-friendly, understandable language for SMEs to start incorporating into their business operations and practices. Um, yeah. And that is ultimately what will allow for scaling and for pivoting to happen um, within a regional context or country context. Yeah, I love what you say because it brings us beautifully to Kamea to talk a little bit about digital technology. If we go back to Merka's presentation, he showed us this beautiful image where right at the center we're talking about uh, digital uh, digitizing. And so maybe, Kamea, a quick comment for, from you in terms of how Digital technologies, what are the opportunities that you could see those playing in the agricultural sector? But it's important for us to have a frank and robust discussion. And maybe you can say one or two things about some of the challenges that you see to uptake so that we can wrap our heads around how we might surmount <clears throat> these. Um, and that's how we're going to end off this uh, panel discussion. But your your voice now, Kamiya, for, for a minute. Yeah, I can talk about uh, what I know, which is the Latin American and Caribbean uh, experience in terms of, of uh, digital technologies adoption. Uh, I could, I mean, we all know the, that, that, that famous McKenzie report where agriculture was at the bottom of the table, uh, mentioning and showing how lack of digital transformation it was as a sector, right? And definitely that's some, that's some, something that has happened for Latin America too. Um, but I, I mean, it, it has definitely changed the speed at which uh, technology, digital technology is being adopted, especially by farmers after the COVID, right? So at, at, after COVID, I mean, during COVID and during the, 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 the quarantines that many of our countries l lived in for many months, even farmers couldn't go to their fields to check on, on their crops or, then, or their animals. So they needed a remote solution. They needed digital solutions to, to help them keep on producing, keep on um, 
doing and um, keep on the on, on producing the uh, the food that we that we eat, right? So I think that definitely uh, w broke the barrier. That I mean, there was a cultural barrier for sure, and it definitely was broken uh, after. I mean, during the the months that we lived in quarantine uh, here in Latin America and Latin America. But I mean, that was something that needed to happen and accelerated a lot many of the trends that we have been seeing before COVID, right? And so definitely there's still some challenges. I mean, we innovation cycle, adoption cycles in agriculture, it's, I mean, they are constrained by nature um, because of the, because we, we work with living things basically. Uh, there's definitely uh, infrastructural challenges in terms of um, signal connection, internet across Latin America. Uh, there's, I mean, but but definitely there's another huge uh, and not necessarily so tangible uh, challenge, mm -hmm. which is regional ag tech hub integration. We have across Latin America many different climates, many different uh, types of production, and so. Uh, where, where ag tech or agrotech innovation lies, it's not in the main cities, it's in the inner cities where food is produced. So we have many uh, important cities in Argentina, in Chile, in Brazil, in Mexico, in Colombia, but they are not the capital cities. And those mm -hmm. cities are not integrated within, within them, within Latin America. And so I think we have been working a lot on that aspect, trying to integrate ag tech cities across Latin America to share the knowledge, to share how they can uh, start adopting innovation, they can um, experience this digital transformation that can have so many good impacts. Uh, yeah. And so definitely that's something that uh, it's important to, to note. And in terms yeah. of opportunities, and with that I'm going to end, sorry. Um, in terms of opportunities, digital transformation uh, is, I mean, it's definitely can have a definitely more easy way to enter into the lives of, of farmers and agricultural producers if we come up with ag fintech innovation and innovation to market access. So that's the biggest pain that a typical producer, agricultural producer or farmer in Latin America has, access yeah. to, to, to market and access to credit loans on other financial business, other financial services, sorry. And that could be the entry point to adopt other digital technologies. Yeah, Camille, you've, 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 you've lifted not only the challenges, but the opportunities. I saw Lee Henda nodding as you were talking about the disintegration between some of the ag tech cities. And so we can see that although there is a regional opportunity to scale up, we have to be um, quite robust about facing the challenges that make this just slightly out of reach. I do want to thank uh, yourself, Hans, Camille, Lee Hender. Thank you very much for a very, very insightful conversation. It's generated a lot of chat in the um, um, uh, commentary in the chat as well. But um, we've got two more uh, small segments to get through. So I'm keen to make sure that uh, we get to those. So thank you so very much. As we move now, to our third segment of our program. We're upping the energy, we're upping the ante a little bit. I'm going to invite uh, Jackie Kitibiwa on. She's head of business environment at, at FSD Uganda, and she's going to be sharing uh, with us the announcement of the 2021 Seed Award winners, uh, and she's going to be telling us a little bit more um, about uh, this uh, particular uh, awards and the program. Jackie, I'm going to hand over the floor to you. So I can see that Jackie is also um, not, um, the, the, it doesn't seem to be audio right now. So if I can just ask my uh, technical team if we can see if there's anything that we can do to help. But uh, Jackie, just to double check that your microphone is, in, is green at the moment so that uh, it is, you are unmuted when it's green. Thank you very much, Nozi. Can you hear me? Thank you very Perfect. much. Um, I'm so honored to be here. I participated as a juror on the Ugandan panel. And um, my name is Jackie Chitiba, and I work with financial sector deepening Uganda, an independent not-for-profit organization that is funded by the UK government and the Gates Foundation. We are a think and do tank that has been set up to shape financial markets that are competitive, that are inclusive, and are respectful 
to the needs of um, businesses and individuals. We provide technical assistance as well as catalytic grants for innovation and scale. So participating in the Seeds Awards um, is quite is extremely important to us, especially given our target beneficiaries who are mainly women, youth, smallholder farmers, MSMEs, as well as refugees. So taking part as a juror in the, um, in the Seeds Award has been quite a fulfilling experience, and I'm very honored to share some notions and lead the celebration of the 2021 winners and runners up. From water treatment and purification tools to renewable biomass fuel, solar technology for health workers in rural communities. Um, the finalists of this year, of this year are eco-inclusive entrepreneurs and innovative enterprises that have not only birthed inventive solutions, but are making creations that are changing lives, building resilience, increasing incomes, and helping communities to get out of poverty. The CEDA World Initiative has awarded over 300 en enterprises in 40 countries and has facilitated the disbursement of over 1 million euros since its inception in 2005. This year, we have nine winners and 39 runners up selected who will receive grants and business support. Thanks to the pivotal support from the government of Germany and Flanders, and I'm sure both organizations are represented in this call. The finalists, were carefully assessed using a robust and, rig and rigorous selection criteria. And all these enterprises are locally driven or locally led early stage entities that are looking to become financially stable. The selected entities demonstrate entrepreneurship and innovation, deliver economic, social, and environmental benefits have shown a potential to scale and to be replicated. They have collaborated and partnered with organizations and stakeholders across board. And for countries like Botswana, Zambia, and Malawi, these entities have an adaptation focus. It has been an honor and pleasure for me to work to be part of a panel. And I want to emphasize the incredible opportunity I have had to work with such a diverse group of experts from local and international organizations who also served as jurors. These specialists were exceptionally keen to share the experience and are willing to provide the much needed support to these mostly young entrepreneurs. The entries from the participants have opened my eyes to the countless possibilities that currently exist in building eco-inclusive eco and sustainable products if proper support were to be provided support that is fit for context and fit for purpose. I also had the opportunity to work with a team of highly committed members and benefited from the professional and dedicated support of the SEED team. The success of the 2021 winners and runners-up is especially impressive at this time, a time when the world faces one of its most challenging times in recent history the COVID-19 pandemic. The headwinds are especially strong for these early stage enterprises with disrupted supply chains, upsetting distribution and access to inputs and lockdowns and restrictions affecting the physical and mental well-being of their workers. These enterprises selected demonstrate agility and innovation in the face of crisis and resilience to continue serving local and vulnerable populations. So today we are thrilled to announce the winners and I ask everyone here to join me in celebrating the stories and the impact of these businesses and to recognize their role in a green recovery. Their success is our success and their journey is also facilitated by many of you uh, who are part of this process. The profiles of these enterprises are now available and have been shared in the chat. And there's a link in the chat that you can go and read about these enterprises. But for now, um, please allow me 
um, to introduce a short video where you get to meet the winners and runners up and get to hear from them as well. Thank you very much. Welcome to JVL YKMA Recycling Plant in Akole Somenya. We are very excited to be selected as a winner of the Seed Low Carbon Awards for 2021. We process organic waste and fecal sludge to produce quality compost for farming and clay floor briquettes for households and industries. As an eco inclusive setup in Ghana, our goal is to become a sustainable circular economy enterprise. Our company was established to be eco-inclusive at heart and our vision is very simple to make circular economy a reality. We have reduced significant amounts of carbon footprint. We are upcycling and repurposing as well as enabling a small enterprise or individual by giving them an alternative choice of sustainable material at a lower initial investment cost. Circular economy transition is becoming a global agenda. We are proud to be one of Thailand's leading circular economy enterprise. Thank you very much. Thank you. We convert waste into sustainable materials that we use back in circular economy. So we help uh, businesses, governments, even individuals to process and manage their waste. In Sampang, I'm very on a mission to create a world where there is zero waste and we want to accelerate the adoption of circular economy. In order for us to really solve the global waste problem, we need to collaborate with as many people as possible. Hard Care Labs is closing the loop of menstrual hygiene economy while taking care of awareness, accessibility and their disposal. With this award, we are going to serve more than a lakh females and we are going to provide them a, a hygienic environment while maintaining their privacy. Thank you. At Peak Energy, our mission is to increase access to electricity in hard-to-reach and underserved markets. We build hardware and software for remotely monitoring many grids and solar home systems to help solar companies reach unconnected communities. I believe social enterprises like ours are really helping to create social impact and supporting them would allow them to scale out their solutions to reach more beneficiaries. Evogen basically was founded to provide clean energy, uh, waste management, and sustainable agriculture for health and nature in Malawi. Our vision is to reach uh, 30,000 uh, customers by 2030 so that we can work alongside the sustainable development tools. We'll be using this award and the funds that come with it to scale our solution. So what does this mean? We can invest more money in impacting more waste collectors, making recycling accessible to more residents, and this will result in more tons being diverted from landfills and carbon emissions being diverted from entering the atmosphere. I believe it's important to support solutions like ours. For one, we are focusing on making recycling accessible to those who generally cannot access it because they don't have the funds to do so. We're also integrating a very large informal sector in South Africa, making their jobs more dignified, safer and rewarding. And lastly, we're incentivizing residents for recycling with us through our virtual currency called your money. We are excited to be selected as the winner of the Seed Awards 2021. Uchwami is an eco-inclusive enterprise in Zambia and our main goal is to empower the women, the youths and the orphans by substituting charcoal burning and cutting down of the Miyombo trees with an environmentally sustainable model of beekeeping supporting enterprises like ours translates in reduced inequality, social inclusivity sustainable livelihoods and as well preserve the environment.
It's a massive congratulations uh, to all of our winners in heart. What a wonderful way to close off our conversation today by inviting one of the nine winners that you've just seen who's actually uh, in this conversation with us. That's uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Tomawan uh, Vir Virodshian, uh, who is a co-founder of Morello from Thailand. Uh, to share a few words for, with us, one of the things we heard uh, earlier today is the opportunity of making a green recovery real and tangible. And we certainly do see this uh, from our winners. So, Tamanwan, it's over to you as you share a few words with us as we begin to close on our conversation. Over to you. Thank you. So, what do you do if you get once in a lifetime opportunity to be part of a solution to create a positive impact to this world? Well, I got my chance right now, and it's called More Loop. Hi everyone, my name is Tamun Wan and people usually call me M by short. I am a co-founder and COO of Molu, an online surplus traffic marketplace. And today it is my honor to share a story of mine and a journey of Molu to you guys. I'm a second generation of an OEM garment manufacturer located in Bangkok, Thailand. And my factory has been operated for more than 30 years. And I also work in this fashion industry for over 10 years. And throughout my career, garments and textiles always said to be the top three sunset industry in Thailand. So I am questioning myself whether I can really survive with the situation. And with my 10 years of experience, I finally have found my own pain point, which I want to solve, a very simple and might be similar to many other factory owners. It is about the desktop fabric hidden inside our factory, the leftover from fashion industry. I always believe that everything starts with a little thing, a little trigger. So I didn't want to solve any world problem at the time. I just want to solve mine. And I often think about how I can use this leftover wisely. While I was thinking about it, I saw my friend's Facebook yeah, and he was posting about a marketplace startup. And suddenly I got interested by that. So I called him up to ask about it. And as our conversation go, a new business model start to form. Not only he has experience in marketplace startup, but he also has a lot of passion for waste management as well. And of course, I think you guys can guess it out. So now he is my co-founder, Amon Pon. So we agreed to start more loop together in order to solve my pain point and serve his passion. So along the way, he has introduced me to this amazing work, which is called circular economy. As more loop starts, we start with a really low budget of 2000 US dollars. We apply lean startup model to test our idea back in 2018. And we want to make more loop to be the simplest way to source for sustainable fabric. We want to prove that circular economy can be a business in reality. So a day after learning a business, Molu already upcycled fabric for over 10 tons and prevented greenhouse gas emission about 160,000 kilograms of carbon dioxide, which equivalent to the diving distance about 35 times around the world. So we have met many types of customers, such as brand and designers who purchase our fabric and use for their own collection. We also provide B2B model for our customers, such as international organizations, corporate, university, environmental activist groups. We have upcycled this surplus into finished product for them with a story to tell about how much carbon footprint they have been prevented by not using the virgin material. And you know what, things go viral, words of mouth, a lot of press and media, both online and offline, international and local have contacted us for an interview and invite us to be a speaker for what we have done. And the bottom line is, we never spend anything for our marketing and things go far beyond our expectations. So at the beginning of 2020, while our business going so quick 
and we are super excited about our performance. Then came an unexpected pandemic that affect everyone all over the world. Yes, I'm talking about COVID-19. So it creates a huge hiccup for almost everyone. And so do we. At the time, our B2B model has been dropped more than 80%. Thing was so complicated and the situation is unknown. We also have to adapt ourselves just like the other. We pivot to make our own merchandise and Zinma Loop is a material hub, so we can select the best quality and we launch our house our house band collection. And our t-shirts and cost marks so like extremely well back then. And these products help us to survive. So we got a lot of new fans from this channel. Two months after that, our business we, uh, came back. We produced a lot of marks for corporate clients to use and also to donate. At the same time, our online fabric sourcing platform just stood with the pandemic as people want to shop online. So we end up our 2020 by upcycling another 10 tons of fabric for that COVID year. As of now, although the situation remains challenging, but we still improving our business. We got a lot of support from everyone, including Seed Award. And to win this prize, make us realize that what we do is matter. We want to prove that not only the big guy can do circular economy business, but little guy like us can do it too. And I want to encourage everyone to keep on doing what you are passionate about. And for us, our passion is to make a circular economy a reality. And I am sure with more loop model, I can turn this set to be sunset industry of mine to be sunrise again. So back to my first question, what will you do if you know that you get once in a lifetime opportunity to be part of a solution? I hope your journey is as enjoyable as mine. Thank you. What a beautiful question to close us on. What do you do when we get a once in a lifetime opportunity? And someone you've taken your opportunity to ensure a sunset industry becomes a sunrise industry. What a beautiful way to close off our conversation. Thank you very much for making the time to join us. Ladies and gentlemen, I have stolen two minutes of your time. So my apologies to you in advance, but to thank you profusely for your time, for your participation, to all our speakers, uh, who of course have participated today and of course to all our partners who've made this conversation possible. Remember the hashtag is HLPF2021. We keep the conversation going on social media. From myself here in Johannesburg, South Africa, thank you for joining us and I hope you found all the resources in the chat useful um, and that you will be connecting and following up with many of those opportunities. It's clear that we are beginning to see inclusive and more resilient recoveries and we are seeing uh, green MSMEs right at the forefront. Let's keep that momentum going. Let's keep learning together. Let's keep sharing. And of course, let's keep marching on as we build forward better. Thank you so much for joining us. It is goodbye for now.